Good evening, everyone. I'm Leslie Donna Williams, CEO of Wits University's Chimolohong Digital Innovation Precinct. Chimolohong meaning place of new beginnings. I'm also quite fortunate to be a member of the inaugural class of the Obama Foundation's Leaders Africa program. And it's my privilege to be joining you this evening. Madiba, many of us who have been privileged and are privileged to have been born in his lifetime, holds dear memories for many of us. My first interaction, which is very special to me, is having met him on my 15th birthday when he came to my school in El Dorado Park in Johannesburg. And the reason why this is important is because he had a knack of going into places that are often not seen and not heard. His ability, sorry, his practice of service, of servant leadership and personal sacrifice has inspired me and people around the world to go beyond personal gain and take action on issues that affect our generation the most. This evening, I'm joined by two special individuals who have a unique understanding of the power of Madiba's legacy. The ability to wield moral authority, empower young people, and provide access to education, thereby creating a strong and vibrant Africa. Mam Grasa, a champion of social justice, education, a symbol of moral authority to us as well, a strong activist who is female as well. <laughs> <laughs> President Obama, who through his foundation is investing in the power of young people like me to transform our communities at home all around the world. 14 years after having met Nelson Mandela, I had the privilege of celebrating yet another birthday, this time watching Barack Obama becoming the 44th President of the United States. Mm. As we celebrate Madiba's life during his centenary, it is more important that we connect and that we reflect to the spirit of his work and the reason why we come together to create a stand and, unif and unify together on the changes we want to see in the world. President Obama, Madiba said, a frightened world cannot think clearly. Both you and Madiba had a way of connecting to the power of positivity instead of fear and conflict to address change, social change. In today's age, young people, find, we find ourselves in a world where we're dealing with issues of xenophobia, of inequality, of further segregation in the world. Do we always need a common challenge to unite around these issues? or can common hope be a possibility? And also, how do we go about designing that? Well, well first of all, good evening, everybody. It's good to see you guys. Uh, and and I, I just want to call out uh, Lonnie Bunch somewhere uh, for having uh, yeah. achieved this magnificent institution. Uh, I could not be prouder to be with Grace and Michelle, uh, one of just the best people I know. Oh my goodness. Across the board. <laughs> uh, and, and anybody who knows her knows her wonderful spirit and, and leadership. And I could not be more proud uh, to have Leslie here, uh, who is an example of the kinds of young leadership that exists across the continent of Africa, here in the United States and around the world. Uh, and I want to give a shout out somewhere to Mary Zients as well, because she put in a lot of work uh, to make this happen this evening. Um, I, I promised I was going to give short answers, <laughs> to, even though they're big questions. Yeah. And uh, there is always a struggle between hope and fear, uh, between the world as it is and how we'd like it to be. And during times of tumult and disruption, 
whether it's technological, economic, uh, information, migration. Uh, the danger of us resorting to fear, to organize ourselves, falling back on tribe, race, ethnicity, uh, sectarian uh, lines, that always becomes strong. That's been true in this country, in the United States. You know, it, you can actually track that when the economy is doing better, typically our politics is less divided. It gets more divided when people are feeling insecure and anxious. Uh, it's true in South Africa, it's true everywhere. The good news is that fear is typically the province of the old. <laughs> and Hope is the province of the young. There are, there are occasional exceptions, like Madiba, who stayed young at heart <laughs> throughout their lives, um, never succumbed to cynicism, and, and always believed in the possibility of human connection and mutual understanding and rational thought all of which then could contribute to uh, a society that works for everyone. Uh, but the, the thing that I always uh, remember from all his speeches and his reading is how much joy he took in spending time with young people yeah. and investing in young people. Mm -hmm. and. The reason is because you don't come in with preconceived notions about how the world has to be. Yeah. Uh, a child does, isn't born with suspicions about somebody who's a different color. Oh, no. uh, they have to be taught that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the more that we're investing in young people around the world and in our own societies, the more hopeful I am that we can overcome uh, some of the challenges and problems that you mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stop there so that. Uh, sure. You can ask uh, Grasha. Sure. So, Mom, just speaking on, on the, the theme around connection, Madiba, Madiba's friendship with Uncle Kathy, Ahmed Katrada, was quite legendary. And they remained friends and allies until the end days. In fact, Madiba went to the extent of negotiating for the release of, of the political prisoners on Rubble Island before his own. How do you go about finding those true values within people to connect with them and, and choose your allies? Who, how do you decide who you're going to stand in the fire with? Hmm. I think one of the gifts which uh, uh, Madiba had was to be able to identify in every single human being the goodness in those people, including in those who were his enemies, became political adversaries, and actually he had to be the alliance with them to bring about the profound transformation which took place in South Africa. But let me go back to this. I believe what helped him to identify this is because he took time to transform himself. But even when he, he left uh, the trans guy, he was actually a young man, a closer man. But he, if, if we remember why he left the trans guy, it's because he refused to take a wife who had been lobbed for him and was being offered to him. Yeah. And he said, I have a right to choose. And he ran away, actually, against his own guardian because he didn't want to take a wife which was not of his choice. What is this important? Is very young, he asserted his individuality and the right to make choices. Then he goes to Johannesburg. I was a young man, but then he's exposed by the like of 
Walter Sisulu to the nationhood of South Africa. Remember that at that time, the trans guy was a Bantustan. So for him to understand South Africa as a nation and to understand the diversity of those who make the South African nation, we have to remember it was Walter Sisulu who played a role in his life. And that has transformed him from this uh, Tosa person to a South African. The important thing with this to answer you is it was through that process, for instance, which Madiba moved from being strictly, let me say, uh, tribal and to value and even to overcome the barriers of race. When he meets the likes of uh, Ruth First, Joe Slough, when he meets even in terms of ideology, when he meets the, the, the ones like the Moses Kotane, who tells him that, you know, despite the fact that I am black and Tosa like you, but I recognize the value of Joe Slough, the value of Ruth First, and of many others. And that's when they come, all the other colleagues with this. So it had to be a process of reinventing himself to understand that he could not be part of the struggle if he didn't recognize the value and the contribution in its diversity of the people he was exposed to. So that carried him along his own life. And we didn't talk much about the time he had to negotiate, but it was a process. You would tell me now, how did he manage, for instance, in prison, to work with people who belonged to the PAC, who belonged to the Communist Party, who be all the parties who were there? It was a process in which he learned to extend his humanity, to recognize the humanity of the others. And then he took it to the bigger picture of now bringing the nation together. I don't think he would have been able to do that if he had not had this journey. I was too long, but if you are saying allies. Yeah. Huh? You say allies. Most of the people Madiba you work with, they were not allies. Yeah. They were his colleagues. They were part of him. The only time he had to look at the other side and to transfer himself to the other side, to the skin of the other, is when he had to negotiate with the National Party. Yeah. And that he recognized. You don't negotiate with your friends, you don't negotiate with your allies, of course. You negotiate with those who have completely different points of view of yours, but you, build, you come to the middle of the space. So, to respond to this how, I think any one of us here, we have to have that journey individually. Otherwise, you will not be able to recognize and to value other people if you had not had internally the process which helps you to recognize and to value others. Sure. Just, thank you. From that from that point, President Obama, Madiba did spend a lot of time listening to the concerns of opposition, even forming a special committee within parliament to, to take on their views. Have you had a point where you've held a strongly held view on something and you changed your mind? And what brought that about? Also, mm. <laughs> as young people ascending leadership, what are those points where we do need to step back and be open to shifting our, our view on something? Well, I think Russia's point about self-examination and self-reflection as a tool of leadership is absolutely crucial at whatever level. And it's true if you're heading up a nonprofit organization, it's true if you're heading up a museum, it's true if you're heading up a business, and it's true if you're heading up a, a country. Uh, because if you don't know what you stand for and what your values are and what you believe, then you also don't know what can be compromised and what can't be compromised. Mm. Uh, what's of lasting value and what is situational and temporary. And uh, I change my mind all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, based on facts and evidence. Yeah. And exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've said this before, I, the, the challenge we have in our politics in every country is when people start conforming facts to their opinions and biases, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to shape their opinions and biases based on the facts. Uh, because if, if, you, if, you are, if, you're, if you're starting off based on facts, um, then we can have a discussion, we can have an argument. Mm -hmm. And you can change my mind because you can prove to me mm -hmm. that, well, actually, I may think that the moon is made of cheese, but then Grasha will present to me facts. The astronauts went there, They're, they, <laughs> and there was soil and, uh, yeah, footprints, and, yeah. <laughs> and they came back, and we have photos, and mm -hmm. so, and, and I may change my mind. I can't do that if I, if I deny facts. So, so, so that'd be point number one. Um, there, there are times where changing your mind also requires listening to other people. Mm -hmm. And I'll give actually a, a, a specific example of this. Um, throughout uh, my young adulthood and my early political career, I had always believed that members of the LGBT community, gays, lesbians, transsexuals, et cetera, should be treated equally under the law like everyone else, as someone who has been, um, as somebody who is a member of a group that's been discriminated against. Mm -hmm. It violated my core principles to think that the state would discriminate against somebody else. But I would say uh, early in my political career, my general view was when it came to uh, same-sex marriage that, well, if it, you can just have a civil union with all the legal uh, mm. uh, uh, rights associated with it. You don't have to call it a marriage. It doesn't create as much conflict with respect to people's religious predispositions. It will be fine. Mm -hmm. But of course, it wasn't my place to say it was going to be fine. Mm -hmm. right? And so when I have close gay friends tell me, you know what, this does not make me feel fine. Yeah. Because this, this is not simply an issue of contracts and you know, me being able to visit my partner in the hospital. This has to do with the, the, the stigma that I feel that I am not the same being able to uh, join together with somebody I love in the eyes of the state, right? Particular religious institutions have the right to make their own rules, but this is a state-recognized marriage. Listening to the pain they felt in not feeling that recognized allowed me to say, you know what? That makes sense, I get that. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So you know, one of the things I, I think I may have mentioned to the, the Obama fellows when I met with them, because I say this whenever I talk to young people who want to change the world, um, the first thing to do if you want to change the world is uh, shut up and listen. Mm. Because, because we always assume we know what's best. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but before you can actually lead people, you need to know what do they feel and, and where are they coming from? What's their perspective? Uh, what's their story? Uh, and, and, and I think that the, the challenge we have in our politics is that similar to people wanting to block out facts, we, don't, we want to block out other people's stories because it may contradict yeah. our predispositions and biases. Um, and, and openness to other people's experience and new facts requires a certain kind of courage. Um, and it goes back to your earlier question about hope and fear. Fear induces closed-mindedness. Yeah. We like to build up barriers to prevent us from hearing things that may force us to re-examine 
who we are and what our attitudes are. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and letting go of that fear, I think, is, uh, is important. And, and leaders who, who feed fear uh, typically are also ones who avoid facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 that wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to stay with you for, for a minute, President, and I'd love to hear Mom Grass's view on this as well. So in many of, I mean, around the world, we, there is still seeming, a seemingly archaic view of the role of women in the workplace, in society. And many of these beliefs are often brought about our perceptions of our culture through or our religion. Our traditions, our religion, our culture shapes that. What are some of the, firstly, do we need to steamroll those beliefs to be more modern? But also, what are the unintended consequences of social fabric if we do? <laughs> Let's have Grasha answer this first. <laughs> <laughs> because I find that if I suddenly have a whole bunch of opinions about women that are offered before women offer the opinions, <laughs> <laughs> At least in my household, I get into trouble. <laughs> That's some wisdom there. Yeah. Just want to communicate to all let of me, you. Who... Let me start by uh, challenging the notion that uh, the, the way women are being treated in society is because of uh, uh, religion. Hmm? You mentioned religion. And you mentioned also what you call the traditions. You know, you said culture. You said culture. And I want to challenge this. Okay. You know, there's no really culture which uh, uh, denies the dignity of human beings. It's culture. It's traditions. And if you like, it's this social you know, constructs along centuries, if you like, which have been, for reasons, if you go back again to use the president's words, to defects, which led people who were in position of power to develop those social constructions and to say a woman and a man because they happen to have different sexes. They are, di they are different, yes, but they have different value. Because it's not a question of being different. It's the value which is recognized to a man and the value which is recognized to a woman. To say, a woman has much value. There's nothing in culture which will tell you this. In, there's nothing, even in some religions, is, although, Along the years, it has been structured in a way we believe it's a religious issue. You go to Islam, I'm not very familiar, but I have been told that no, it's not true that it's Islam in its essence which discriminates against women. So let's disconstruct this, you know, and accept that if it is man-made, it's constructions, then we can deconstruct. And we shouldn't take it as if, because it's culture, because it's religion, it cannot be changed. It can and it must be changed because it is, you know, it is constructions of us people. Now, coming to you, young people, because I would like to challenge you exactly on that. Because you, you, you have much more opportunities in which you relate and you work with young men and young men, they work with you, and they recognize the value, for instance, of the kind of work you are doing. You are doing an ex excellent job. There's no reason you would be discriminated. And perhaps these are the facts which you have to use in your generation against what we did in centuries to deconstruct and to accept that it's the dignity of a human being which is in each one of us second. And then the value it is not determined by sex. The value is how you contribute or not contribute to your society, regardless of the sex you have. And in these conversations, I think they have to be very deeply 
I mean, discussed amongst you. You mentioned the issue of workplace. Can you explain to me, for good and sake, why a woman who is highly qualified, very experienced, I mean, she has done all the steps you could expect, but because she's female, yeah. she's paid less, simply because she's female. And sometimes even if she is in position, a higher position, but she will not have the same salary as a man in the same position. Can you explain this to me? There's no reason for this. But unfortunately, today, there's no one single country, my president, which can say they have dealt with this issue of equal work, equal pay, in a satisfactory manner. No one has succeeded. So you are asking a question which I will take it back to you. Because as my daughter, who has had much better, I mean, opportunities than mine, using the facts, huh, you have to begin to take, this is one of the issues in your lifetime. I'm insisting in lifetime. You are going to deconstruct because you can. And because you also have the, 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 the tools of communicating with the millions in one second, this is your responsibility to say, ah, 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 this has happened to me, it's not going to happen to your child, okay? Who is my grandchild? That is the issue with you. So it, I think we need to demystify all this and to be really courageous to confront realities and to say, ah, uh ah, -uh, it is nothing which can justify, and because it cannot be justified, neither by belief or whatever, we have to change it, and it will be at the forefront of transforming this. So I'm hoping from wherever I will be, even down there, I'll see you. And your child, your child will have to be different for the kind of socialization you have had. I, take on the, I accept the challenge. Yes. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the only thing I would add would be, uh, and Michelle and I talk about this quite a bit, uh, how we educate our boys. Uh -huh. uh, because yes, uh, women have to knock on the door, but um, they shouldn't have to knock any louder than boys do for opportunity. And we create, in all sorts of subtle ways, entitlements in our sons very early on mm -hmm. that uh, get duplicated mm. and reflected in our societies. Mm. And when those privileges get taken away, they're upset. Yeah. yeah. Now we teach our boys to assume if they're speaking, then the woman or the girl, she should mm -hmm. listen and pretend like what he's saying is really smart. <laughs> and she shouldn't, certainly shouldn't interrupt him or contradict him because, well, that's not ladylike, right? I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but we mm -hmm. socialize our boys around a whole set of expectations. They grow into men who have expectations that if they're mediocre, they can be the heads of things. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they can, uh, it, it, you know, no, <laughs> that, that, that they don't have to be as qualified because to some degree, it's their birthright. And I think, in some ways, it, it again is connected to fear. A lot of our politics right now is people feeling as if their status and privileges are being taken away. Yeah. Or at least that there is competition for it. Mm -hmm. And that's probably as true in gender relations around the world as anything. Um, and so men get scared, because they know Oh, she actually might be smarter than me, or is working harder than me, or 
gave birth, and that looks really painful. I wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a reaction that uh, I better keep her down mm -hmm. in order, because I don't, what does that say about my status? If, if, if there was fairness in a, in a level playing field. Uh, and that's built into our society in all sorts of ways. So how we treat our sons, how we model for our sons expectations about how they treat their classmates, how they treat mm -hmm. women in authority, how we treat our partners and our wives and our mothers and our sisters. You know, they're, they're soaking all that in all the time. Um, and as, some, as a father of, of two daughters, uh, you know, so I, I can't speak to raising sons, but I can tell you, uh, you know, my daughter's been watching my wife, and if any young man who's interacting with them, or anybody who they're interviewing with, mm -hmm. somehow thinks they're gonna <laughs> take a second fiddle, <laughs> they are badly mistaken. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you guys gotta get your boys ready. Because, uh, because, you know, as you said, a, a whole generation of young women are, are just not going to put up with some of this nonsense. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that they dislike men. It means, you know, they're going to call it like it is. And, and, and they're not going to just automatically grant you uh, authority just by virtue of, you know, sure. how uh, you were born. So South Africans tend to use humor to tackle difference and difficult issues. In fact, Madiba was known to um, give people a direct role and responsibility and, and package it with a smile. We're, we're in, in our, our um, mission to build a, a unified world and a unified, inclusive society, are we at the point now where we are perhaps taking ourselves too seriously and steering Oh, towards politically correct language, instead of just acknowledging difference and sometimes having a laugh about it? it, it look, th th this is an interesting question. Um, I would make a distinction between, and it, when we, we use the term political correctness, mm -hmm. the origin, that term originated from people who were accustomed to being able to insult mm. <laughs> women or minorities and not have any consequences, uh, suddenly feeling like, hey, how come I can't do that anymore? Mm. And, <clears throat> well, you can't do it anymore because it's insulting to other people. And you should stop that because uh, that's, that's not, uh, a natural right of yours to be able to demean or put down other people. Uh, and so I don't have a lot of patience with folks who say, well, you know, what's the big deal, you know, if somebody's going to a frat party in blackface? Well, you know what? Uh, you're right, it's not a big deal, so stop doing it. Mm. <laughs> because it offends somebody. Um, <laughs> you, you'll be fine not doing that, <laughs> right? Yeah. Or not telling an anti-Semitic joke, you know? Th there's no reason for you to do it unless you think it's important to put somebody down mm -hmm. and to ignore history. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do, I have no patience for that. Now, what I do believe is that uh, and I worry sometimes that those who are progressive want to extend human dignity to all people and so forth start losing a sense of humor, but it's not just losing a sense of humor, mm -hmm. it is I am actively looking for evidence that I am victimized. And that becomes its own assertion of power, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I want to be offended. Oh. And there are times where people may say something out of 
ignorance and not bad intentions. They may use the wrong words, but we're not feeling as if they are exhibiting malice. They are open to being educated. Um, and, and, and we have to apply some common sense to that. Uh, and that's true across the board, because if you get too offended, in some cases, it means that you are presuming that you've never said anything stupid or offensive. And it goes back to what Grasha was saying about self-examination. I, I, I can't get too high on my horse because I know at some point I've had prejudices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know at some point I've put somebody else down. I, I, I remember mm. language that I used when I was a teenager because I was insecure, so I maybe mm. teased somebody mm. in a way that was cruel. So I remember that about myself. Well, let me, let me not suddenly be the thought police all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and look, how we draw these lines, how we draw these distinctions, I think are okay. uh, important. Uh, one rule I would use is that if there is a group of people who say they are deeply offended about something, then I think the default should be sure. don't offend. Thank you. Okay, lightning round, super fast, quick response before we get dragged off the stage. Mom Grasa and President Obama, I'd love to know very briefly, in your view, what is one thing that could lead to a failure outcome for youth in Africa, and what are you exceedingly op optimistic about? What makes me optimistic, I'll focus on that because I don't have much time. It's exactly what I see emerging, even if you like, like bubbling amongst young people on my continent. You know, if you look at uh, how, for instance, the kind of civil society organizations which they organize themselves, they take initiative. They don't need to be uh, asking permission to anyone. They organize themselves. They define the agendas of things they want to do. They, with no means materially, but using their creativity, I mean, to find solutions to their own problems, it means, you know, what they have as tools, even when they came from school without skills, they're developing skills of organizing, defining priorities, and working together to find solutions. If you look at, uh, for instance, the issue of entrepreneurship on the continent today, it's mostly young people who are at the forefront of that. And yes, we know we have this big challenge of unemployment. It's not governments who are going to provide the employment to young people. It's mostly them as with, through entrepreneurship, through also the contribution of private sector, meaning developing skills, et cetera. But that's where the answer is. Because otherwise, we will be dealing, again, I will use Adeline, Madeline Albright yesterday, is that the solutions of 21st century have to be found in 21st century and not using the, the methods of 18th century. And young people are teaching us, I mean, to look at the challenge of today and to take up the responsibility. So we should yeah. take initiative and get organized. Exactly. Yeah. Get organized and take initiative yeah. and solutions, results, very concrete things. Thank you. President? Well, I think Leslie is an example. The people that uh, we've been convening and working with uh, through the foundation, uh, they are extraordinary. And if you meet any of them and you hear about the work that they're already doing on the ground, um, you can't help but be optimistic. The, the danger is not that these young people uh, will have a failure of imagination or energy or uh, innovation. Uh, the risk is that old people don't get out of the way. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think that you know, part of the reason that Michelle and I decided to focus through our foundation on training the next generation of leaders uh, is because, uh, look, w we've had the opportunity to lead. And it was 
an extraordinary privilege. And you know, we don't depend on an office for leadership, but it does mean that you have different roles to play at different phases. And the most important job we can play now, and I think sometimes African leaders, American leaders, mm -hmm. leaders everywhere, forget this, is that there comes a time where your contribution is not on the field or on the court, but it is as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, it is as a mentor. It is as somebody who is helping to guide, connect, resource, spotlight a whole range of new talents and new energy that's coming. And, and uh, I think that if, if, if those of us who've had mm -hmm. uh, the good fortune uh, and the blessing of, of serving their people in some capacity uh, recognize that, then uh, our job is to help you succeed. And uh, if we do that, I have no doubt that uh, not only Africa will shine, but uh, so will the world. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can I can I can I take the privilege of old people? Huh? When when President Obama came to South Africa last year to celebrate with us uh, the hundred years of Madiba, I said something which I would like to repeat to uh, people who are in this room today. We celebrate Madiba because in the 20th century, if you look and you say, what kind of a leader who was able to carry the aspirations of millions of people across the globe and millions of people would identify with and to feel this is the leader who represents me? It's Madiba, right? And in 21st century, if you close your eyes and, say, and look around and say, who is the leader who carried the values and aspirations of millions of people, and those millions of people see themselves in that leader? Who is it? Obama. Obama. Okay. And, no, no, I haven't finished. I haven't finished. I haven't finished. And I, I, I made it a point at that time that, you know, there's something which might sound politically incorrect, as you were saying. It just happens. It's a fact, again. It's a fact that in 20th century, it was a leader who is of African origin. In 21st century, it's also a leader. Ah, you hear me? And me, and I'm saying me as a grandmother, I take pride on that. I take pride on that. And my president, I want to say, there are many similarities between the two of you, between Madiba and you. Yes, perhaps as well. But it just followed the fact that when you stepped down, the first thing you thought of it was to invest in young generation of leaders. That's precisely what Madiba did, okay? It's to understand that what I am, what I have achieved, it can be achieved by millions of other young people. And as you were saying, the important is to create space and to coach them and to allow them to fly. I just wanted to say thank you. This is what we need. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.